Okay, so uh, the title of the talk is a Transhumanist Theory of Ethics. And, uh, okay, some disclaimers. So, firstly, it's called the Transhumanist Theory of Ethics, but it is purely my own foolish opinions. It doesn't represent any transhumanists or transhumanist organizations. Uh, okay. Okay, so firstly, before we start, I want to give uh, uh, some uh, historical perspective. Well, actually, I'm going to talk about morals, right? So morals is something that actually uh, changed considerably over time. So some things that previously were considered uh, uh, completely immoral, like, uh, oh, no, not the other way, some things that today are considered completely immoral, like slavery or, you know, conquest of other countries without any good reason, were completely standard previously. Uh, on the other hand, uh, some things that we have today, like uh, uh, democracy or, uh, you know, sexual liberty, stuff like that, were, would be totally strange or even unacceptable to people who lived uh, like, uh, the Middle Ages or something. So, uh, uh, similarly, it is, uh, uh, it is reasonable to expect that in the future uh, the perspective on morals will be different again. So, I think, that my own opinion, at least if we want to understand something about this, we must keep like, a very open mind because uh, none of the things that we uh, believe are somehow self evident or obvious, they can be just sort of artifact of the culture which exists today. Okay, so, so I'm going to talk about ethics. So what exactly do I mean by ethics? So uh, what uh, I actually refer to by ethics is just anything that, uh, you know, the, the, the basic values that allow you to choose things. Like you have to choose between two things, like this girl here has to choose between an apple and an orange. So she has to have some goal, some terminal value, right, that she tries to optimize according to which she chooses. You know, otherwise, what's, what's the difference between two choices? Uh, so, of course, there, there may be some like, intermediate goals that you want to achieve in order to achieve something else. So this is not really interesting for ethics. This is just technicality from my point of view. But in the end, the thing that you want to optimize is the subject of ethics, the way I define it. Okay, uh, Okay. so let's compare uh, science and ethics. So, uh, is there any connection between the two? So, uh, okay, so in order to make a choice, you have to predict what is going to happen as a result of this choice. And you have to evaluate the outcome that's going to happen. So, uh, science actually comes in here by predicting things, right? So, when we want to predict, then it's useful to have uh, science. But it doesn't really tell us much about how to reveal the outcome, right? Science doesn't tell us what is good and what's bad. It tells us that if we do some specific action, then some outcome will result. Where this outcome is good or bad is completely a different sort of question. So, and still I think that some things can be learned from science because it creates a factual context, right? So if you know a lot of facts about the world, then it might actually affect your moral judgment of things. Uh, but ultimately, science cannot determine moral truth. Okay, so let's uh, compare, compare this to historically. So historically, we have, on the one hand, on the one hand we have science, in which we have an accepted methodology of how science should work, which is called the scientific method. And here are all sorts of people who contributed to formulate created this method, like this William of Ockham here, who invented Ockham's razor, and there's Newton, who was approximately the first guy who made a mathematical model or something, and uh, there's Karl Popper, who wrote a lot of uh, stuff trying to formalize this philosophy, and uh, more or less all the things here on, on this side are widely accepted and undisputed and so on. On the right hand side, we have what's called moral philosophy, right? So people have been thinking about the subject of morals and discussing what is 
moral, what is not moral, is it objective, is it subjective, is it relative, is it absolute, so on and so forth. And basically, the, the, the most important difference is that they haven't agreed on anything, more or less. Right? So, so here are some random guys who thought about morals, and Jeremy Bentham, and Manuel Kant, and Elizabeth, I don't remember what's her last name, but, uh, okay, but each of these guys had a completely different opinion. And, uh, okay, so the question then says, is there really anything new to say about this? So moral philosophy exists for about uh, 200, 2,500 years, and, you know, since Aristotle, people have been saying things, haven't agreed on anything, so maybe we're just stuck and we should like, give up. But, uh, but actually, there are, there are, I think, reasons why uh, we might have something new to say. So, first of all, science actually changed considerably our whole view. So this may allow us some new insights, right? And on the other hand, technological progress poses entirely novel challenges. So, as a result of technological problem, progress, there are ethical dilemmas which haven't existed before, which we should solve somehow. So we have more challenges somehow, in, the subject, in the field of morals than we had before. Okay, uh, okay so here I connect to the whole theme of transhumanism. So, uh, okay, so what, what the hell is transhumanism? So, transhumanism is basically uh, the set of beliefs uh, written here, where I think the red things are common probably to everyone who calls himself transhumanist, I think. Uh, and actually, the black things are my own personal opinions, that not necessarily everyone agrees. Um, so, most importantly, transhumanism is the belief that human evolution is going to continue. So, actually, Homo sapiens sapiens that we know today is not the final word. We're going to have something better. That the way it's going to continue is by self modification instead of natural selection. Right? So, before we just had some guys who you know, killed some other guys, some people starved, some people didn't starve, and we have natural selection. So, now we're going to have Pretty soon, I think, we're going to have the technology to modify ourselves in a way that is controlled, it's planned, it's engineered. Okay, and it's going to involve both physical and mental enhancement. And I think mental enhancement is the most important part, the part which is the most impact. So, uh, my own opinion is that this process is actually going to be infinite and unbounded. So there's not going to be some point at which we reach the ideal human. There's always going to be evolution, and because it is unbounded, eventually we're going to have total departure from Homo sapiens sapiens. So, the people that are going to exist, if you can call them people, or sort of descendants of humanity, they're going to exist in, I don't know, 10,000 years, just for example, are not going to be similar almost at all, almost have nothing in common at all with Homo sapiens sapiens we know today. Uh, some very general things would be common, they would be sentient, right? But they, the assumption, like, we cannot assume that they will have two arms and two legs. This is ridiculous. Um, okay, and there's also the question of singularity, which is uh, somehow an important uh, thing in this context of transhumanism, but it's not so important actually for the things that I'm going to say, where this process of Self-modification is going to be some kind of continuous improvement, or it's going to be some like a phase transition in the middle, or just like sudden, it's called an intelligence explosion, things like that. I'm not, I'm not going to go into much detail there. Much detail there. Okay, so how this thing uh, can happen? So there are all sorts of ways that we can imagine this can happen. Uh, I've written them here. So we have genetic engineering, uh, mind uploading, artificial intelligence, and cybernetic enhancement. And there might be things that we simply haven't thought of. Might be, the real thing might be something completely different, of course. But let's take a look at those. So, okay, so genetic engineering actually is progressing quite well. We know how to translate genes between different organisms from different species. We already have 
like uh, agricultural crops, they're genetically engineered. We sequenced the entire human genome, but uh, still there are many challenges. Uh, we don't know all the gene functions. Uh, we only have a poor understanding of the human brain. Right? If we want to do mental enhancements, we have to upgrade the human brain somehow. But we don't understand how it works well enough to do that. And we have the protein folding problem, so even if we know the sequence of a gene, we cannot predict the three-dimensional shape of the protein that is formed from this gene, so we don't really know what to do with this. So we're, we're still, we, we cannot design a completely new gene at this point. Uh, okay, artificial intelligence is an interesting sort of transhumanism because it is a, a sort of uh, a discontinuous transhumanism. Like, uh, the, the idea here is that someone will create an artificial intelligence which will be smarter than human beings and then we don't really need human beings anymore. So this is like, a, instead of like a continuous evolution, we just you know, replace something with something completely different. And uh, of course the guy who invented uh, more or less this whole field is Alan Turing. Um, and his prediction was, and he invented the Turing test, right? the Turing test, how we check that something is really an artificial intelligence. So we, we take uh, a human, we take an artificial intelligence and we lay let someone to talk to them without knowing who is the human, who is the computer. And then if you cannot tell the difference, then the no. program passed the Turing test. Turing's own prediction was that the, in the year 2000, there will be a 30% success the computer program in a five-minute Turing test. And uh, actually, I checked the actual numbers, and there is a chatterbot that claims to have come quite close to this number, strangely enough, but actually I talked to it and I think the guys who interrogated it probably were drunk. There's no way you can assume this video. Okay. Uh, so there's also this guy Ray Kurzweil who wrote a lot of stuff about transhumanism and he thinks we're going to pass the Turing test by 2029. And we have some actual things to show for, so we have like the Watsons Watson computer from BM which won the Jeopardy game in 2011. But uh, on the other hand, there are some uh, people like Noam Chomsky who are much more pessimistic. Actually, he thinks that artificial intelligence is going completely in the wrong direction. It's not leading anywhere. But, uh, okay, then we have uh, the thing of uh, cybernetic enhancement. So what's the idea of cybernetic enhancement? Actually, the humans and computers have different advantages. Right? So there are things that Humans do well, but computers cannot do, right? Okay. For example, looking at an image and uh, understanding that this is actually a cat and a dog in the image. Computers aren't really good at this. Uh, there are things that are even harder. Uh, on the other hand, computers can like multiply 20 digit numbers very quickly. Right? The other stuff, humans cannot do at all. So the question is, what happens if you can somehow combine the advantages both and get something that is even better than the sum of its parts. <coughs> so to do this we need to build a really good human machine interface. Right, so today we have like human machine interface, like keyboards, mouses and displays, but this is really lame. I don't know, like, the amount of information that I can transmit to computer bed, it's it's very small, it's it's inconvenient, it's not intuitive for my brain to do it, and uh, it's really inefficient. Um, so maybe we can build uh, better human machine interfaces. And in fact, it turns out that the brain is pretty much a plastic uh, thing. If we connect something to the brain, it, it can somehow learn by itself how to use it. So this is really good news because we don't really understand how the brain works. But it might be that although we don't understand it, we can still plug it into the computer in some ways. And actually there, there are some successes in it. So there are neuroprosthetics for visual and auditory sensing. Artificial eyes and ears actually co connect to a human and they work. And there is like a, uh, paralyzed patients who have robotic arms that can move the arm and do things with them. So we, we, are, we are going there. Um, okay, and then there's the thing of mind uploading. So what's the idea of mind uploading? The idea of mind uploading is let's take a brain. Okay, so brain, we don't know exactly how they work but we know how their basic building blocks work, more or less. Brain is really a huge number of neurons. And each neuron, we more or less understand how it works. 
So maybe if we know the exact architecture of the brain, you know, all the neurons and how they're connected to each other and some properties of these connections, and we can build just a simulation of the brain without just understanding precisely how it works, we can we just build a exact simulation and we'll have a human brain running inside a computer. So this is actually a very popular thing because it has some implications in mortality, right? If I can put my brain into a computer, then I don't have to die anymore. This is good news. Okay, but uh, uh, I don't really care about that aspect, but... So, and actually we have a project which is called the Blue Brain Project. So they claim to have already simulated uh, a million red brain cells. So like a small portion of the red brain. And they're claiming that they're going to simulate a full red by 2040, which is uh, 100 million cells, cells, and they're going to have an actual human in 2023. Uh, 10 to the 11 cells, so probably this is very exaggerated and actually you can find some analysis that explain that basically they probably said it to get more budget, but uh, still, if, if they're even saying that they're there, then probably they're not very, very far from there, right? Uh, unfortunately, if are even C. elegans, so C. elegans is a nematode, which is uh, a model organism, it's like something like the most it's a multi very primitive multicellular organism that we know everything about, so <coughs> more or less, but uh, still not entirely everything because we don't even have a simulation of a similar gas. This is a bit ridiculous. There's actually an open source project called OpenBorn which aims to simulate similar gas. Uh, okay, so ethics in the humanist era. Uh, okay, so let's uh, connect it all back to the subject of ethics. So, I said before that new technology poses new ethical dilemmas and indeed we have here all sorts of ethical dilemmas that arise. So, many people first will say that the whole idea of transhumanism is like playing God, right? Messing with the human design, so what is that going to lead to? And then the human relationships, so I think I skipped this part, but yeah, when I talked about in the subject of the context of human-machine interfaces, there's also the possibility of new human-human interfaces. Right? Because if you connect a human to a computer, you can connect to computers, you have a very new ways of two humans communicating. And even today, uh, communications and media change the way human society works. Uh, like all sorts of Facebook rights and stuff like that. But if you think about it, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Because if, if you think about uh, like uh, communication technologies, like just plugging two brains together, this is going to have some much far, far-fledged effects. And uh, of course, there's also the question of human rights. So, if we are going to have all sorts of simulations and artificial intelligences and cyborgs and whatnot, then how do we apply the whole field of human rights to them? Right? How do we? How does it work? But if we can make a zillion copies of someone on a computer. Does each copy get a vote, for example? <laughs> okay, so, and uh, I'm going to ask a question here, which is uh, um, actually a controversial question on purpose. Uh, so, so, actually, our morals, the, ultimately, the origin of our morals is just like the evolution of the human species, which occurred in prehistoric conditions. Then the question is, can we actually apply the same morals that evolved in prehistoric conditions to a society, to modern society, and then even worse, a transhuman society? Okay, so, uh, okay, so now I'm going to go back a bit and speak uh, a little bit about uh, uh, things that people said before about morals. So, uh, uh, the guys here are Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, and they invented something called uh, utilitarianism, which was very popular in the 19th century. And here there's actually a poem that Jeremy Bentham wrote to explain uh, the philosophy. So it goes, intense, long, certain, speedy, fruitful, pure, such marks in pleasures and in pains endure. Such pleasures seek if private be thy end, if it be public, wide let them extend, such pains avoid whichever be thy view. If pains must come, let them extend to few. 
Okay, so translate it to simple terms, what basically this guy is saying, you should have as much pleasure as possible and as little pain as possible, okay? So basically what he says is that we're going to construct some function which is something like the sum of the pleasure over everyone. The pain is like negative pleasure or something like that. And we need to maximize this function. So this is what, what we should do. And uh, okay, this is uh, just another example. Uh, this guy actually lived much uh, before German business. Uh, this guy called Mosley lived in China like uh, 500 years before uh, current era. And uh, he invented something that uh, today we call state consequentialism. And basically, he also said that there's some uh, uh, target goal that we should optimize, but instead of pleasure, he spoke about values like social order, material growth, and population growth, some, somehow things related to the state. So somehow it seems like it's very uh, like nationalistic before, because it talks about a specific state, but uh, I think that in the historical context it is actually not so, because uh, from a Chinese point of view, China is the whole world. Right? The, the emperor of China is like the emperor of everything. So mm -hmm. social order in China is really social order of the world. Okay, so this is really a side note because it's related to some ideas that I'm going to speak later. Uh, okay, so what are the strengths of utilitarianism? So it's uh, rather intuitive, like uh, pleasure is good, uh, most people probably agree if they don't analyze it uh, too deeply. It's uh, relatively simple and it's relatively close to mathematical, right? So it's almost a mathematical formula. If you sum all the pleasures, so I don't know how you measure pleasures exactly in what units, but it comes quite close to something mathematical. So also, should you optimize like the pleasure tomorrow, or the pleasure in a thousand years? Also not very clear, but it's uh, it's as close as philosophy comes to mathematics, more or less. Uh, so okay, so there are actually some criticism of consequentialism in general. So both of these philosophies that I mentioned are consequentialist. What does it mean? It means that the value of the action is measured by the outcome of the action. Right, so if we know what was going to happen at the end, we, didn't, we don't care, we care about the goals, we don't care about the means. This is basically a form of consequentialism. And there are some guys who said that this is bad. So why do they say this is bad? Because, for example, there is no concept of justice, right? So there's nothing here to say that uh, we should like, punish bad people or give candy to good people, because maybe in some circumstances, Somehow, the opposite is uh, the optimal thing to do. And uh, why I think actually this criticism is wrong, because I think that it confuses uh, ethics with social law, right? So if you want to uh, formulate laws for society, obviously the law should say that guys who steal should be punished, and guys who don't steal shouldn't be punished, and stuff like that, because otherwise we won't have a functioning society. But uh, it doesn't mean that uh, well, it follows from consequentialist ethics. It doesn't mean that there are no exceptional cases in theory. Uh, another criticism is that there is actually, in consequentialism, no distinguishes of what's usually called duty and supererogation. So what is duty and supererogation? Like duty is something that you have to do, and supererogation is something that you don't have to do, but if you do it, then you're a nice guy. Uh, so from my point of view, this is simply a relevant distinction. So I want just to know which choices are better than other choices. So I don't have no need just for arbitrary threshold somehow there. So again, when we want to formulate law, then it's relevant, right? Because there are some things that we want to give punishment for, some things that we don't want to give punishment for, and maybe there are some things that we want, want to revive. But, so we have to choose where, where's the line. But from the point of view of fundamental ethics, somehow I, I don't think it's I don't think it means the same. Okay, so what is, uh, does it work with utilitarianism? Or in general, what's called hedonism. So it's a philosophy that's based on uh, pleasure. So, uh, okay, so let's imagine that we have a pill that uh, gives us uh, an immense pleasure, but makes us completely stupid, and uh, so we're just, uh, you know, we become like zombies that have lots and lots of pleasures, constant orgasm, but we don't want to do anything at all. So is it a good thing? I don't think it's a good thing. You be the judge. Also, actually Bentham thought that the advantage of his philosophy that also applies to animals, right? Because animals, 
can feel pleasure and pain. So they also have moral values. This is great. We don't care about the humans, we care about animals. But then the question is, okay, let's suppose we replace humanity with like a zillion seal guns experiencing intense pleasure. Is it like a good thing? I don't think so. And there is another problem that maybe if we build an artificial intelligence, then maybe it won't have a concept of pleasure at all. Maybe it will work somehow differently. And then uh, somehow uh, our philosophy applies to uh, nematodes, but it doesn't apply to artificial intelligence, so it doesn't seem right. And uh, actually, I'm not the first person to say that hedonism is not a good idea. There was, was said uh, many times before, like for example, this guy is George Edward Moore, who did his own philosophy, and I won't go too much detail there. Uh, okay, so pleasure is not uh, a very good idea, at least in my own opinion. So what I'm going to talk about now is how do we find fundamental moral values which work, right? And this is of course, uh, this is of course again my own point of view. Uh, so first of all, they have to be related to humanity, like uh, related to humanity in some broad sense, like intelligence, self-consciousness, etc. Things like nematodes, I don't really think we should care about them much, and uh, it should be another. On the other hand, it should be sufficiently general to apply to transhumans, posthuman, sexual terrestrials, whatever. So, if we are going to have very different humans in the future, then we still want the same one will to apply, otherwise, these are not universally useful moral values. Okay, so, uh, okay, so, okay, so the moral values have to be related to humanity. So, what is humanity? What actually makes humans special? So, okay, so humans can uh, communicate. And they can uh, think, but uh, my point of view is that these things are actually means that you use to achieve some goals. So this is not uh, somehow the end goal in itself. So what do you do with these things? You do all sorts of things. You create art, you create mathematics, you create science, you create technology, and uh, and there's also one more thing that you can create is basically which is humanism, right? You can self-improve. So. This is maybe strange to say that transhumanism is one of the identifiers of humans because so far we don't have any transhumanism. But if you think about it from the point of view of a post human that exists like in a million years from now, somehow the most uh, important property of humans must, might be that, from his point of view, somehow the most obvious difference between humans and other things is that they're able to improve themselves. Okay, so. Therefore, I suggest to actually take these things and uh, just uh, turn them into fundamental moral values. So, so our moral values are going to be progress in mathematics, uh, science, technology, uh, creation of art, and auto-evolution, which means the improvement of the human itself. Um, okay, but uh, okay. So let, let me. So th this this doesn't really. Uh, define yet something, it's not well defined yet, it's not, not even well defined in the philosophical sense of well defined, because it's not clear how we uh, sum these things together, like right? which of them is more important and so on. Uh, but uh, okay, so let, let's, let's speak about these things in some detail. So, evolution of mathematics. So, mathematics started out from things like you know, adding and multiplying the numbers and some basic geometry and over the years it evolved and now we have uh, stuff like, uh, you know, algebraic geometry and homotopical algebra and uh, things that most people have no idea what they mean and uh, so, so if these things are stuff that uh, like any people in uh, school can learn and, uh, uh, this was like the frontier of mathematics, like when mathematics appeared. Then today, the frontier of mathematics is something that most people uh, probably don't even have the ability to learn, if they, even if they want. Uh, okay, uh, but there's actually a huge depth of knowledge. So, in order to get here, you need to learn a lot, a lot, a lot of different things in the middle. And uh, uh, the same thing basically happens in science, right? So we have uh, 
here I think it's the geocentric system and uh, this is uh, like something that uh, today you learn in high school but Newton invented it and uh, then we got to all sorts of stuff like uh, quantum mechanics and general relativity and quantum field theory and today we have string theory and uh, more or less it's the same picture, right? So the, the, the fraction of people who understand this or uh, even theoretically capable of understanding this is probably not very big. Um, Okay, so uh, so we have a growing complexity. So what is the what is the consequence of growing complexity? That fewer and fewer people can understand cutting edge science, and it takes more and more time to learn enough science in order to make progress. And okay, now maybe a controversial claim, but I think that sooner or later, Homo sapiens sapiens won't be able to make further progress, but even if the world becomes less intelligent, because there are actually some. Researchers that claim that humans are actually evolving to become less intelligent. Since the hunter gathering period, there isn't enough selective pressure on intelligence, so we are actually becoming more stupid. But this thing is up. Uh, okay, so we have a problem. There's lots of complexity more and more, and progress uh, gets slower and slower. Uh, I think that we can actually see that this really happens because. Uh, people publish uh, somehow breakthroughs in uh, an age which becomes somehow later and later. So before we had lots of people who like, made breakthroughs at the age of 20, today like it's, it's going to 30 and even 40. But, um, okay, so uh, uh, another thing to note is the problem of survival. So if we go into the future, then just surviving becomes more and more difficult. Right? We face all sorts of dangers, like an asteroid impact, something that can happen. Something that's probably it's going to happen later, for sure, is the sun that is going to swallow the Earth. And then, even if you move to other planets, then eventually the sun will stop working at all. And if you go to even very, very far future, then the whole universe will run out of fuel because like the whole source of energy in the universe is nuclear fusion. Eventually, nuclear fusion will just run out of stuff. And if we go even to more insane, like this is a result really insane future, like 10 in the big number of years, but still, uh, we also have the problem of false vacuum collapse that probably, according to our current understanding, it is probable that our universe is actually only meta stable and not stable, and at some point, uh, like the vacuum is going to uh, transform to some other vacuum and we're going to have a universe with completely different laws of physics everything that exists today is not going to make it there okay so survival okay, so the conclusion that uh, I draw here is that indefinite survival and I want to be ambitious, I want to survive forever uh, indefinite survival requires indefinite technological progress because Okay, so it might seem that actual technological problems, someone might say that it's irrelevant because, okay, the universe is going to run out of fuel, what are we going to do about that? We can't do anything about that, right? But think about it, if actually it's going to happen like in billions and billions of years into the future, and like technology was only evolving for like a couple of hundred years, so try to imagine the technology that we're going to have in a few billions of years, right? So this is something scary, so maybe we can even fix the universe. Um, Okay, so the conclusion I combined from this thing is that we have something that I call a cycle of progress. Like we have a lot of interdependent things. We have progress in mathematics, we have progress in science, we have progress in technology, and we are going to have progress in like, the human mind itself. And all of these things are prerequisites of each other. So if the human mind doesn't evolve, then eventually these guys are going to be stuck. Right? If mathematics doesn't evolve, then these guys are going to be stuck, and so on. So they all, all of them depend on the other. Okay, N now I bring in some uh, another thing here, which I called the long-term postulate. And uh, the long-term postulate says that the consequences at later times are always more important than consequences in earlier times, or in other words, only the asymptotically distant future is important. So why is it a good postulate? Uh, for me, it is completely intuitively self-evident. But uh, maybe other people think differently. That uh, only what happens like in a week is important. What happens 
in here is not important. Uh, so maybe some uh, uh, things that might change your mind if you think like that. The, first of all, uh, long-term thinking is also a distinctly human quality. So if you want to build a system of morals which is uh, somehow very human in its nature, then long-term thinking is probably a part of it. Uh, also, somehow from a philosophical point of view, when we get to the future, then the present won't longer exist, right? So uh, how how is this supposed to be meaningful? Something that is not doesn't exist in the future, and uh, even worse. It can be argued actually that according to Schinsky, only the symptotic future really exists. Like the present is actually just like measurements performed by someone who actually or some recording that someone in the symptotic future has, something like that. But so only the future exists, so we should only care about that. Uh, okay, so when I combine these things. I get something which I call the universality of progress consequential. What I mean is the following thing. If we only care about stuff that happens in the asymptotically far future, then it's not really important to say whether uh, technology is more important, or whether evolution is more important, or even just basic survival is more important, because all of these things uh, are completely dependent on each other. And if we optimize something in the a very long term, then it should not be important which one of them exactly are we optimizing. And uh, so this is, of course, uh, uh, like this is something far from a rigorous proof, but intuitively it feels right. So I think that what we have here is something like uh, uh, what is called uh, uh, in condensed matter physics, it's called universality. When you have a big number of different microscopic theories, when we zoom out into the microscopic, they all become the same. So the thing that here, something similar happens. We have all sorts of values, but when we push all of them to the asymptotically long future, then they all converge to the same thing. And therefore, we have arrived at an unambiguous, because only by standards of philosophy, unambiguous, uh, because almost none, none of the words I say here are really defined, but unambiguous uh, uh, theory uh, of ethics. Okay, so uh, from theory to practice. So, uh, okay, it's a nice theory, but uh, it's not so simple to use it because we're supposed to care about the asymptotically far future, but like if you have a complex system, then it's very hard to predict what happens to it over time. So, this is one problem. Another problem that the choices that you make in your daily life, like choices that only affect you and your immediate neighborhood, usually. And uh, it's not so easy to imagine how they're going to affect the entire civilization. But uh, still, I think uh, it doesn't mean that the theory is unuseful because uh, you can always generate like a best guess. And this is like the best you can do anyway, right? Uh, okay, so what about ordinary ethics? So uh, this uh, sounds uh, like uh, it might sound that there is absolutely no relation between the things I said and the things that we usually call ethics, like it's, it's wrong to steal things, it's wrong to, you know, to kill people, it's wrong to uh, cheat on your wife, or maybe it depends on opinion, but whatever. So is there really a relation between the two? Okay, so the so-called ordinary morals really developed by evolution, right? The, the usual natural selection kind of evolution. And it might have involved genetics and memetics, but somehow it evolves. And, uh, uh, well, what can be said about uh, ethics as opposed to all the other things that evolution created? If ethics somehow is optimized for the preservation of society and its prosperity through cooperation. So, usually the things that we are called ethical laws, uh, so the difference between those things and somehow the other things that we do, is that those things are somehow uh, optimized for the group, not just for the individual. Yeah. Therefore, I think there is actually a direct relation because, like a function, the better society functions, the better progress we get. So I think there is a rather close relation between the ordinary sort of ethics and the ethics that I defined. Because I want to have progress, right? We can't have progress if people are going to just kill each other and steal everything. Uh, okay, so of course uh, one should warn that there is a danger in, in radical changes because. Someone can take this theory and 
conclude that like we should kill half of the population and do something, other thing to the other half or something like this. So uh, I'm not saying it's necessarily a bad idea, but uh, one should be careful about this stuff because you know, the ordinary ethics is time tested. So we have like a system that works somehow, and if we do some radical changes, if we go back, right? If we go back and remember that it's very hard to predict complex systems then it's very dangerous to do radical changes that we don't really know what they're going to do. Uh, okay, so it doesn't mean that ordinary ethics is the same thing that uh, progress consequentialism. I think that ordinary ethics comes, like, if, you, if you're just an ordinary human living today and you want to act according to progress consequentialism, that it's probably not very different from ordinary ethics, but as we go here, as we go like from here to here, then we somehow go outside the domain of applicability of previous ideas about ethics, but the, the ideas of progress consequentialism still remain applicable. So from my point of view, it is like some sort of an extrapolation. It's, a thing about it. it's like, a, like a theory that is more general. Special relativity works in cases that are more general than you know, that you don't have that. Okay, so let's uh, summarize. So we had the, the idea of progress cycle and long-term postulate, which led to the universality of progress consequentialism. That we can uh, start from all sorts of values and end up with the same uh, moral theory. That uh, under ordinary circumstances, progress consequentialism sort of implies regular law ethics. However, it's much less ambiguous and it's applicable to much more general situation. But we still don't really know how to derive some other more interesting, very specific conclusions. And uh, that's it. Okay, so I think we have time for questions. Yeah, uh, I have one. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, so you talked about uh, the relevance of ethics to computers, to artificial intelligence, and you said that. Well, for some reason, since they're not human, we and we created them, we have no moral obligation for them. But when there are artificial intelligence, says they're not going to care that we don't want to give them bites, right? They're going to be there. I, I didn't say that we, we shouldn't care about them. I said that like uh, just ordinary ethics and law doesn't really take this into account. So uh, probably we should care about them, but. Uh, in order, but we don't have really a good uh, understanding of what it means to care about them. But we don't have some system of ethics which takes artificial intelligences and other things like that into account. Mm -hmm. So actually, if they, according to me, we should really, if, if, if these guys contribute to progress, we should care about them, right? They're good guys. Yeah. Um, if I understand you correctly, then the idea of progress consequentialism is that beings have value only as far as they contribute to progress, yeah. right? Um, so there are two questions which are a bit unclear. Um, what exactly is the end goal of progress? Like, when can we say we've had all our progress, now we can enjoy what we have? We don't have an end goal of progress. It's, uh, on, on, on the contrary, we have like an infinite process of progress. And we just want to have more and more of it. So there's no end goal. There's just something that you go on and on optimizing. Uh, this reminds me. Uh, my parents come from the USSR, and they were in a constant state of building socialism. And they were always told that you know life may be difficult now, but we're building socialism for the next generations. And you know that never stopped. I was born in the 80s and lived in. Uh, yeah. You know, two families in one apartment in yeah, Moscow. Yeah. So, so it appears to me that there is eventually things we like, like art. You talked about music and uh, and art in your talk. They happen right now. If I devote my life to music, I'm not actually making any progress on transhumanism, right? Uh, it appears to me that by progress consequentialism, my life would be meaningless. I would have no moral rights because I don't contribute anything to progress, right? But on the other hand, I'm doing something that makes life worth living. I understand it. So let me say some things about it. So first of all, about the parallel to the USSR. So we know that the USSR didn't work in that, right? So it fell apart, and 
it didn't uh, so it did some useful things, but uh, somehow the Western world did much better. So we know that as a fact, the USSR system didn't work, and the Western system did work. So from the point of view of progress consequentialism, this is a proof that the Western system is better. Because I only care about the outcome. I, I don't care about uh, like how you reach the outcome. So the Western system just won. Uh, so this is one thing. Uh, another thing about the value of someone's life. So, okay, so this is really connected. It's really connected to, to this point. Right? So I talk about things that are like, very large. Like the whole thing. Progress of civilization, transhumanism, and things that are going to happen in years, but eventually the choices you make in your life are somehow very small compared to that. But it doesn't mean that your choices don't have impact. So eventually, civilization is just the sum of people. So, like, there are like a few billions of people, each of them does something, and the sum of this total is civilization and progress and so on. So, uh, okay, so you can only do the best things you can do. You cannot uh, like, uh, start a golden era of progress because you don't have superpowers to do this. You can do some, some impact, which might be very small compared to the whole, but it doesn't mean that it's meaningful. Like in, inside the spectrum of this very small thing, you can still do something better or do something worse. For example, you can dedicate your life uh, to music and other people can enjoy it and it can help them to uh, be creative and invent things and uh, invent fire music or they can have inspiration and they can invent uh, science and mathematics uh, like uh, I think that most uh, scientists and mathematicians actually last uh, It's a short way to steer Then your life doesn't make me die <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's exactly what I'm asking Does Britney Spears have any moral value? <laughs> well, that's what I was going to ask I don't want to connect to comment the explicitly about Miss uh, Spears. It might be that there are some people who are completely wasting their lives. It is not uh, an impossible thing. Okay. Any more questions? Um, can you expand on how current values are a special case of uh, of um, I'm sorry for the term. <laughs> So, okay, so they're not really a special case, but uh, what I'm saying is that, like, in some circumstances, or like in the circumstances that existed uh, in human history until this point, there was like a high correlation between uh, doing things that are good from the point of view of progress consequentialism and doing things. There was a tight relation between the two, because if, for example, you went around killing people, then probably the impact of this on civilization is negative. Or if you, uh, for example, uh, uh, undermine social order by stealing things, then uh, you know countries in which a lot of people get killed and a lot of things get stolen don't do so well in terms of progress uh, as compared to countries where uh, everything, uh, everyone are safe and uh, everyone can do you know stuff that uh, they want to do. Are we sure about that? I think. During World War II, countries where lots of people got killed made lots more progress towards transhumanism than countries who remain neutral. Okay, so World War II is something uh, a bit similar. Uh, I don't know. So this is a good question. So war may create like motivation towards creative technology or something like this, but it also destroys a huge, huge number of resources. So. Uh, I think that it's uh, really a bad thing to destroy such a huge number of resources. So, uh, I'm at least not convinced that uh, uh, somehow the technological progress because people want to kill other people is uh, somehow such, uh, such a significant thing, but I don't know, probably it's, it can be argued. Okay. Any more questions?